You are listening to the MS Power User Podcast. This is episode 45, recorded Thursday, April 27th. Each week on this podcast, we discuss the latest news about Microsoft, including Xbox, Surface, Holographic, Mobile, and of course, Windows. Today, we, we will dig into some of the info shared on the recent earnings call for quarter three that ended at the end of March. There's a bombshell blow to Windows Phone fans that we'll discuss. We will discuss, or maybe it's not so much of a bombshell. That's debatable. We can teach you how to trick your Windows Phone into getting an update it should not be getting, along with how to simulate a feature that was left out of the latest update. And we're going to talk about a couple new devices running Windows 10. One is a unique two-in-one, and the other is something that straps to your wrist. Yeah, there's some lame Xbox stuff in there, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Andy, I guess. I'll, I'll take a nap during that. Uh, and actually, it looks pretty cool. Um, some Scorpio stuff. Things come into Scorpio a lot earlier than was expected, and which, of course, Scorpio isn't actually here. But uh, there's good news there, I, I, I assure you. And there's some cool new demos that are apparently blowing some people's minds. My name is Vernon E.L. Smith, and I'm joined, as usual, by Andy Bennett. What's up, bud? Hey. I I always mention how I'm doing before the show, so like it's always a repeat here for the viewers. But I'm doing pretty good this week. I mean, the last week was kind of rough, so this week's just been thankfully just smooth sailing. I can't complain that much. The weather has been nice. Every everything general has just been nice. So I'm I'm doing good. I can't complain. How about you? Um, I should not complain. Uh, yesterday I had, we had, uh, two dental appointments. Three was, th- uh, today was three doctor's appointments for the children, I should say, uh, and myself. And, um, let's see. Yeah. Buying a new car for my wife so that I'm trying to do that before the weekend is over. Um, scrambling. So she has something to drive. She's going to be working for a couple weeks away. Uh, and I want to get a new car for that. Uh, there's even a film I'm dealing with or preparing for, which is going to be a lot of fun and nerve wracking and a lot of work preparing, you know, getting, getting into that. Um, I'm swamped, man. I'm excited to just kind of, it's weird to, to focus, to tone all that stuff out for a little bit and just work with you, Andy, on Microsoft stuff for an hour. I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, this should be this a fun. Is, this episode. is going to be a f- yeah. This is definitely going to be a fun episode. I mean, just looking over the stuff as we put it in, there's some big stuff to go on about regarding uh, Microsoft's money. That was the name of the episode last the first time we covered it. It was uh, Microsoft's money, and I forget which episode that was. I think it was before episode ten. But you know, Microsoft has their quarterly earning or earnings reports. Well, I I should say to finish our intro that this is going to be an amazing episode, so much fun, and nothing more fun than discussing financial, or I should know, business, enterprise, fiscal responsibility. I mean, I am so thrilled to talk about... <laughs> <laughs> I try so hard to do that with a straight face. It just doesn't work, but... Um, you know, I think it's fun to talk about Microsoft's kind of cool. money because I pretend that some of those numbers are in my bank account. Yeah, I, there's just way too many zeros in there. But um, Of course, every single time I do that, I order off something on Amazon, then I get a letter in the mail saying, Sir, your account is uh, it's in the red. <laughs> so, so I've got to quit doing that. Uh, yeah, that can be a risky thing. And, of course, I'm yeah, dealing I mean, with I mean, purchasing I, a, a vehicle, it, so I'm like, yeah. uh, I, mean, I don't I like can't, that can't either. Can't a guy just get a private yacht in peace? <laughs> So Microsoft <laughs> has services and devices that they they sell and license to people. People pay them for that. Microsoft stacks those piles that piles and piles of cash on barges and ships them over, and then lashes them to the back of mules as they work their way inland to Switzerland, and that's where all <laughs> this money ends up in Swiss banks. Of course, that's not true. Um, but Microsoft does have a lot of money. They make a lot of money. And it's so interesting every quarter to see it's not so much how well they did. It's how well they did in comparison to how well investors thought or an analyst thought they were going to do. And it, it, even like when some of the – I've only been to a few Microsoft um, you know, real events. But it's so interesting to see the, the, um, the analysts that are there who do not – really care two hoots about the hardware or the actual 
functionality of the new services or software that's coming out. They just want to see how, like the tone of it, or they want to see how it's going to impact the bottom line. And I, I just, to me, that just, I, of course it makes sense. You know, that's, that's the logical choice to think about it that way. But I can't get excited about that at all. That's just puts me to I mean, sleep. Yeah, I mean, I I think of that job, and it's like, and it's kind of like a stereotype, I guess. And no, I mean, nothing against any analysts out there listening to this podcast, but like, it's it just to go to event an event only to uh, just judge something and see how it'll impact a bottom line. I mean, it almost it almost sounds kind of like the, I I don't want to say uh, anti fun, but rather it doesn't sound like a very enjoyable job whatsoever not not really because even if you go and and review or you know you're there to see the microsoft's the the surface studio get launched and the dial and like all this cool stuff oh wow and you, you're not you can't even pay attention to the fun stuff you have to like think about the boring aspect of it i don't know like of course it'd be fun to go to all these things but yeah, and whatever, aside whatever. from that, it's I'm pretty sure that anyone who has that job, their favorite color is beige, <laughs> perhaps, or well, just uh, not red. They want to stay in the black. <laughs> they don't want to see anything in the red. <laughs> I see a red door, and I want to paint it black. black. That's an that's an accounting song, accountant's song, by the way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But so yeah, the first thing on the note for uh, Microsoft's earnings report. Oh, we actually have to talk quarter. about this crap. Yes, I can't believe <laughs> no, it. No, I'm excited for this. <laughs> this is quarter three of 2017 fiscal year, and Azure and Office take the lead while Surface and the Phone drop. Now the the drops for the latter two are kind of expected. I mean, we'll go into it more later, but they haven't put out any new Surfaces that are aimed at the main market. I mean. There has been the studio, which is good, but it is not aimed at the majority of people who are buying Surfaces. Additionally, of course, Microsoft isn't putting out any new Windows phones. I mean, this is something we've been, we could talk about for days about how that's been handled, but it's not a shock that Windows Phone is falling and falling and falling. I mean, it's, it's been a constant trend, like every single quarter for, eh, I'm not sure how long, but it's been a while. I, I really don't remember which Windows phone that Microsoft sells uh, it, it is is still available to buy. Maybe this, maybe the six fifty. I honestly I... don't remember. And at this point, I'm not going to look it up. Like it, it's, it's, I think even the six fifty is sold out at this point. Perhaps, so, yeah. Obviously, yeah. the uh, the Elite X. I mean, there's still when there's still devices running Windows 10 Mobile that are for sale, but they're not Microsoft's devices. Yeah, uh, the hardware. and they're not generally not being sold at the many of them. I don't actually. I would. I was going to say not sold at the Microsoft store, but I think they might still be selling Elite X threes. Yes, not they they definitely are selling sure, those but, at the at the Microsoft store. Yeah. All right, though. So uh, to look into yeah. some of the actual numbers for here, let's see. They reported twenty three point six billion non GAAP, and they were expected to report. 23.62 billion and they just slightly missed out on analyst expectations but it's not that it's not that much below i mean 23.6 versus 23.62 it's That's still 20 million dollars yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're do, they are doing pretty good 20 million dollars even if, difference, even if it's say. just it's just the tiniest bit below what might have been expected that's still pretty good i mean it could be worse it could have been say 13 who knows but it's not that big a difference from what they were predicting so just slightly missed but not by much the point is that they want to exceed analysts expectations and so so when that microsoft talks about like the classic example is teasing the scorpio scorpio um you know pro project scorpio and so in that case you know it was preemptive strike and everything but and we, we, we they wanted to get it out there but that's 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 a rare case of of sharing some information ahead of time before it's actually available because they don't want the hype to overrun the reality. They want to make sure that whatever does come out just slightly exceeds expectations and makes people just a little happier than they expected to be happy, you know, how happy they wanted to be or expected to be. So silly. I 
I don't need to. Yeah. We don't need to keep I, I get, on I get this, you. But, yeah. Well, I mean, kind of related. I mean, just thinking about uh, some of the stuff that has been in development for so long that when it eventually comes out, it, it'll it, it'll reach nobody's expectations because they've been thinking, okay, if it's been in development for 10 years, it's either the best thing ever made or it's nothing. Or it's already obsolete. I mean, yeah, that really that as well. Depending depending on what like it that. is, yeah. Right. But so, anyways, looking at some of these numbers here, their continued growth is led on by cloud and productivity businesses, with the br- revenue in productivity and business processes created by tw- or increased rather not created increased by twenty two percent, with office commercial products and cloud services revenue increasing by seven percent. Office consumer products and services rose by 15%, which is very, very good. And both Dynamics and cloud services saw an increase of 10%. More interestingly, Microsoft's $26.2 billion acquisition of LinkedIn brought in $975 million in revenue. So, <sighs> I, I, that's a small number compared to $26 billion. There's no doubting that. And uh, obviously, it's, you know, it's going to take a long time to pay off, you know, to get a return on their investment at that rate. It's, well, it's going to take a while. Yeah, of course, it's going to take quite. To ask, it's going to take like going, thirty years. Going, but yeah, which that I mean, is it going to reach the point of paying off before Microsoft Nokia's them? I think these are two drastically different things. Okay. I mean that's that's fair. It's just that really with the with the trend of Microsoft just kind of like dropping things off a bridge, if after even just the slightest of failures. I mean, I mean there's different parts of the company, yes, but I mean it's just the this has been seen from different angles of it all over the place. That are they going to hold on to this for that thirty years? Are they going to get it for that long? I mean, maybe it'll take a while. I I mean I wouldn't expect them. To just like go, oh yeah, we're done with LinkedIn immediately. I would think maybe if it do- if things don't start improving within five to ten years, will it still be under the Microsoft umbrella? I no, mean, I I looked at this wrong actually. If this is quarterly, it's going to take them seven years to pay that off. Oh, okay, okay. So or, or seven and a half, eight, you know, wherever. Now another thing is that I can't imagine. Uh, they're not going to buy. They should not. A company should not buy another company that is already on its way down. You want to buy companies while they're on their way up, right? So mm-hmm. even let's just take one, two aspects of LinkedIn. Let's look at Lynda.com. This uh, online uh, sales. I don't know what, what do you want to call it. Uh, online training service. Uh, that is only going to grow. We've talked about it before in the past. But that is the, the way of the future. That is how people are going to, you know, there's more and more online colleges, more and more. I mean, like my, I have nieces and nephews that are, do all their homeschool schoolwork online. And it's just going to continue and continue. Like a, there's, there's no question. And, um, and whatever. There's, I don't need to elaborate on that, I don't think. But that type of thing, lynda.com, which is the top one, um, as, I, as far as I know, uh, is only going to get bigger, that type of thing. The other aspect is all that data, the data mining from LinkedIn, which is only going to grow as um, Microsoft, we would expect, LinkedIn itself and Microsoft does a better job of expanding that and truly making it a, um, pulling more people in, making it more of a business and enterprise and a, um, a, a productivity network or something. Uh, more and more data is going to be available and useful to Microsoft, uh, not only for search, but also for, for marketing and all that kind of stuff. We, we know that. So I can't, if, if this revenue, $975 million per quarter, or this past quarter, if we see that dropping, that will be concerning. I can't expect that it would not continue to, it wouldn't be, I can't expect it wouldn't climb. I, I, it must be climbing. It must. I'm sure it will be climbing, um, and it will take mm. a lot less than seven years to pay that off. Even if it isn't a necessary, necessarily one for one payoff, dollar for dollar, uh, Microsoft it is has a lot of other things going for it with LinkedIn. That's uh, fair. That that is completely fair. That's enough, I think, on that. Yeah. Then moving on to more stuff on the earnings. 
The PC is back as Windows OEM revenue increases 5% year over year. Year on year. Yoy. I love it. Yeah, yoy. Uh, all right. Let's see. It's increased 5% year on year. IDC suggests that growth was driven by the commercial PC market going through a replacement cycle and that consumers were attracted to new classes of PCs such as thin and light laptops as well as both gaming PCs and laptops. Or, I, I don't think there was really many. Hmm. The, the number of gaming PCs and laptops I don't believe was very high. Uh, the markup on them, obviously, is, is great, and I understand that. But um, I don't game. Andy, do you think this is – I mean, was that a very big slice of the market, gaming PCs? I It was not before, but if it is if it is becoming one, that's definitely interesting. I mean, again, this is a replacement cycle. So let's say – you know, just to say a general family situation, let's say that kid, kid that's 13, 14, 15 years old – what, maybe it's just time for that the, that the father decides we're going to get everyone in the house a new computer. They have enough money. By to the spend. way, I'm a father, and no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> 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 they get passed down. Like I don't have an extra. Oh, hey, we got our tax return back. I got ten grand this year. Yeah, let's outfit the house with PCs. Now, I, I'm sure there's people out there that will do this. So I'm sorry. Continue. Andy. Yeah, yeah. That's a I, mean, I, was, I was just going. I was going off the situation I saw in friends' houses. I mean, I, I was kind of a bit too poor to ever have that, but whatever. I'm still too poor to have that. <laughs> Con- continue your analogy. All right, though. But uh, I mean, just to say, you know, like uh, kid, kids that are 13, 14, 15 years old, they're growing up on YouTube culture. Most, most, and a good chunk of YouTube culture is gaming culture. And to get in on that, you know, this kind of dream for these kids to have to uh, start a YouTube channel and to record gameplay footage and upload that, that's a big thing that's growing and growing and growing year after year. That kid is going to ask their parents, or parent, you know, whichever, I don't know their situation, they're going to go, hey, I'd like a computer that can do this. I'd like to get into this YouTube editing. I'd like to do all that, and I need a computer that's capable of handling that. Well, generally for that, you go to a gaming computer. And also, while generally people will build their own, there's also a big growth I've seen in these pre-built companies. Like, uh, there's some of them that are actually pretty good. Generally, the rule is to avoid pre-builds. But uh, if memory serves, I believe it was I Buy Power, who has been doing just an excellent job lately. In fact, I even re- think they teamed up with Microsoft for some stuff on Bing Rewards lately. Like, they're doing very well. So, yeah, I th- I think it's maybe not the biggest part of the Windows market, and I don't expect to ever become the biggest part of the Windows market, but it is a growing part of the Windows market. And I would say this it's actually a pretty important part of the market because those are the new kids that are going to grow up to oh, be. Oh, for sure. Adult. I mean, obviously, you want to market to them, and if they find that Windows and Microsoft is cool, or at least supplying well, it's a little their hard. needs, it's, well, just to well. say that for for gaming PCs, really, you don't go to any other operating system for gaming. Yeah, I mean, Steam is, despite the fact that Steam has an extensive collection of Linux games and a handful of Mac games, the majority of gaming you're going to do is completely on Windows. But I mean, there's just no way around it. But the difference between a $700 tower and a $1,400 tower could literally mean the difference between whether or not that kid plays games on a PC or he just plays uh, I don't know, web games on a Chromebook or something. And uh, that right there... Well, I mean, that's the that $700 tower. I mean, that's the price I've seen for some of the entry... Lo- maybe not exactly entry level, but the lower cost pre-built gaming PCs I've seen from some of these companies. That's around the, the basic level, and they're still pretty good computers. Don't get me wrong. But, but that's I mean, what I that's what the, I mean is that that's those are still both reasonable prices for a gaming computer. Different, different yeah, yeah, spec, oh, okay, different ends. Yeah, and, and you're um, and you're still going to be playing decent recent early le- recently released games on both of them. Maybe maybe you'd have to turn the settings down from ultra to high or medium if you go with an entry level. I haven't I have not done any performance tests on these computers because I don't own any of them. But I mean, just generally thinking and speaking here. Uh, you'd still be able to get plenty of what's considered hardcore gaming done on an entry level pre built. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's uh, it is an important portion of the market, albeit uh, a thin slice right now. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a thin slice that like 
I have I don't know the exact specs if there are any really cuz who knows someone might buy a normal computer or build a normal computer and then upgrade it to a gaming rig later on. So we don't know the exact specifications here for sure. It's a very murky area but like if I had to guess I I don't know if I would say right now maybe 10 to 15%, just a guess. It, that would probably be 10 to 15% with 25% maybe being the highest I could ever see it getting. Because there's, I still believe the majority of computers are and likely always will be used for productivity. Either web, either be the web browsing, email, Absolutely. office yes. work, Word, you know, that area I think will always be dominant. Because we also have to keep in mind, I mean, maybe if we talk just consumer market only, that gaming stuff will have a bigger slice of the pie. But the enterprise market's another big chunk of this. I, I think they're an enormous mar- portion. Oh, of for that, sure, yeah. for sure. And that's what you're so gonna like, have, you know, you're they're, gonna they're part of the reason I think that like there's you're always gonna find more computers used for office work than for fun. That's where you're gonna have your Lenovo, Lenovo Think, what are they, ThinkPads, or even your your cheaper Dell Latitudes and whatever, where you know there's decent markup on them. They're gonna buy them in mass, you know, in bulk, and that's gonna be such uh, so many so so many more of those are gonna be purchased than. Your little, you know, i3 or i5 with four, four, eight gig of RAM for your, you know, your typical mom who wants to browse Pinterest on a bigger screen than on her phone. Um, yeah. You know, not to stereotype, but that's exactly what my wife does. So. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's it's interesting stuff to think about, and that additionally it says that a hundred twenty hundred and twenty percent year on year growth in the detachable Windows market. And there's great acceptance of the form factor, which has seen Windows significantly grow its share of the tablet market, which it, which it is interesting that the Android tablet market I've seen has been steamrolled. I've and it, seen it far was fewer... so dominant for so long. Well, oh, for sure. For oh, sure. Well, I'm sorry. I'm the sorry. Long, for the I... longest time, every Android tablet I saw, I mean, every tablet I saw was an Android one, be it a Amazon Kindle or whatnot. I didn't see, I mean, maybe you'd see that one guy with an iPad, but I didn't see that many of them i mean most of them were android tablets a lot of those being cheaper walmart ones yes but let me let me rephrase that though because i don't want to okay be mischaracterized ipad obviously led the way i mean uh, you know it did that it flooded the market um when tablets seemed to be actually productive even if it was from an entertainment standpoint and then, of course, Android tried to follow suit. They tried it with the 10-inch tablets. Nobody really bought those, I think. And then all these little 7- and 8-inch tablets from Android that were just junk. Or not from Android, but running, running Android. Running Android, yeah. And, and those were the, um, the, the, most of those those were were the cheapo th- Walmart ones I'm mentioning. And if, you're, like you said, they flooded the market. They were – everyone had them. I have very strange hiccups now. I apologize. And um, every kid riding in the car, you know, in their car seat was stabbing at icons, trying to get an Android device to run with eight gig of storage on the thing, or maybe sixteen, mm, or whatever. You know, I actually have two of those sitting around. They are as trash as you'd expect, and every time I look at them, I feel just this sense of, oh boy, I would love to chuck that out a window. And in contrast, I have um, this. Uh, where did it go? I can reach it. I guess downstairs right now. A uh, little 8-inch um, tablet, and I totally spaced it out what it is, but it's, it's a Windows tablet. It came with Windows 8 on it, not 8.1, 8. And I upgraded all it all along. It has a stylus built into it. I've talked about it on the podcast before. My kids still use this thing. They love it. This is what they play their music off of. I still use it for taking notes sometimes. There's nothing wrong with it. You just get the updates and, I mean, then clear out some of the memory. It's never been a problem. Play f- f- you know, movies on it and everything. That thing has lasted very well because it's not running uh, a mobile. Well, I think it's doing well because it's it's getting updated. Where an Android yeah. tablet sure is shooting is not getting updated. Well, also, the fact the that w- Windows itself ages better than other operating systems, I believe. I mean, really. I mean, I don't want to say use Windows XP in 2017, but. You can certainly do far more with a computer running Windows XP in this day and age than a tablet that was a cheap Android tablet that you picked up for maybe a hundred bucks, which you certainly could get a lot of Windows XP computers for a hundred dollars. I'm not saying you should, but like just comparison. 
you could do far more with the, with that Windows XP computer. Maybe maybe it would be a laptop. Maybe the bat maybe, but maybe by now the battery wouldn't be too great. But the thing is, on an operating system side, you could do far more with that, and not necessarily be productive, but you could run a variety of programs, and do just a bit more than an Android tablet with a similar level of age. And I mean that kind of like they don't exactly age on the same scale. Windows lasts longer, both the operating system and the device, as opposed to Android, where as soon as that tablet gets a little old, you're going to realize just how slow it is. I mean, I I have a bunch of, and I mean a bunch, of like literally four or five, yeah, five Kindle Fires, and they're decent devices and all, but they are painful to use at this point. You can, literally cannot use any recent Android app on them, and they are from... I think 2013, 2013, 2014, around there. So let's take this back to the Surface RT. We'd love to bring this thing up anytime we oh, can. Oh, yeah, but, yeah but, especially because I still use mine quite a bit. <laughs> but that device was two things in one. Now, many people argue that it didn't do them well. I'm not going to debate that. But it was uh, a actually, touch... Wait, just, okay, go ahead. Just to like, move a tiny bit back and also at the same time, now that you mention it, that Surface RT I have is older, at least by a year than the Kindle Fires I have, and it works better than all of them still. And that and actually course, is stuck on old software. Oh, yeah. Although, really, Windows 8.1 Update 3, which only happened for Windows RT, it's really good, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it was the original Windows 10 start menu on there, along with just the general speed of Windows 8.1, which was really, really good for my experience. I still kind of think it does some stuff better related to speed than 10, but that's a story for another day. Mm. My point being that uh, the Windows, the Surface RT was a two-in-one, obviously. I mean, it was a tablet and it was a laptop type thing in which you had a keyboard. You could do some real work type things with, a key, with you know, typing, and you could do some play or consumption with just the, you know, remove the keyboard and just uh, use the touch interface. Perfect. And this has... This is what Microsoft has accomplished. What they wanted to do was to show OEMs what uh, showcase their operating system. And yeah, at the time, Windows Windows 8 was ahead of its time and still way, I mean, tried to do too much too quickly. And um, anyway, point being that now we do have to where all these different OEMs are making two in ones and three and ones, however you want to call it, still having uh, clamshells, of course, but many of them have touch, touch displays and so on and so forth. Microsoft is doing this right, where iPad, or Apple did do a pretty significant thing with the iPad, but that ship has sailed, and we know the direction that is going. Um, as a Microsoft fan and a fan of Windows, um, I'm really happy with this. Yeah, now to cap off that part, uh, Windows 10 Pro market saw growth of revenue by a full 10%, which is pretty good. Now, on to a Surface as well, related, that Surface revenue has decreased by 26%, which, as we mentioned earlier, they haven't put out new, new Surface devices that are aimed at the majority of the Surface purchasing audience. The it, studio is a completely different thing. And even at that, even the studio, I can't imagine that they're, well, I don't know this for sure, really. I don't know what their rev their markup is on that, but even if it's substantial, obviously the the, the numbers, you know, the, the units that they're selling is so incredibly small. I mean, this is very obvious. That's why the revenue has dropped um, for the last quarter because there's no new devices to sell. People are <laughs> their their Surface Pro three isn't where is it worn out yet, and they don't want to buy a Surface Pro four. Um, you know, it makes sense to skip a generation, whatever. Yeah, um, I mean, that's literally that's what a lot of people yep. do with phones. It wouldn't shock me if they did that with laptops and tablets as well. Yeah, and anyone, everyone who bought it, who wanted a Surface Pro 4 has obviously already gotten it, and the prices aren't yeah. going to drop much more yet. And I, I feel like anyone who is considering a Pro 4 at the moment kind of might feel kind of antsy, like, okay, there hasn't been a new device yet, but it's about the time that we might expect one. If I buy this now, am I going to get burned? Is there going to be, a, like, the day I buy it, are they going to announce a Pro 5? Mm -hmm. Something like that. 
Yeah, and the only and so real, that's that's a common worry as well. The only know. real bump in there was the performance base for the Surface Book, but really that was um, that's another one that's not going to sell much. I mean, that was no. aimed at a very niche mark. It was a niche part of a niche market to begin with. Yeah, and it was um, yeah, exactly. It was just, it was basically aimed at uh, me and people like me. <laughs> <laughs> so not that many people. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it's not a shocking thing. It's uh, generated. Uh, Eight hundred thirty-one million this quarter, which is still real good. Don't That's get crazy. don't get us yeah. wrong. But uh, let's see, from year year on year, it was over one billion, and it, they de- generated a uh, one point three billion last quarter, and that declined fairly quickly, probably because of the lack of new products from Microsoft. And even though they introduced Service Studio and a refreshed Surface Book, they didn't see a huge ri- rise in revenue due to the fact that they are targeted towards a niche market. And then for Xbox stuff, we continue to see some interesting developments here. Uh, whoops, I... Ooh, 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 can I do good. this one? Can I do this one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, there's not much to it, really. Um, yeah, but it's just one it's line, just... really, that, that uh, Microsoft is reporting 52 million X- active Xbox Live users for the last quarter, and which, keep in mind, Microsoft still doesn't release Xbox revenue stats, just live user count, which the thing about that is that active Xbox Live users applies to more than the Xbox One. The Xbox 360 is still active. There's still Xbox Live on Windows phones, of all things. And, of course, you know, you have the Xbox One as well. And I do, if memory serves, they are bringing, they did bring Xbox Live to Android with Minecraft, so I'm not sure if it counts that one. I I personally think that it's just counting up, uh, you know, Windows 10 desktop, well, Windows 10 and Windows 8 as well. Well, It's not not counting devices, it's counting subscriptions. Well, not subscriptions, it's active users, not even subscriptions, this isn't even gold. It's about how many people signed in to Xbox Live for so much amount of time for them to be considered active. Oh, I which see. I you mean. think I think they might even just consider that one sign in in that quarter. So this is something that might fluctuate a bit. Well, it, it it is not there for Windows 10 Mobile in any way that I not that I'm aware uh, of. It te- but it Windows Phone it is. 8.1 it is. It, it's, well, uh, there's there's still Xbox Live integration. There's the Xbox app, which is built in, of course. There's still some games as well, even though a lot of them are available for Windows 8.12 or Windows Phone 8.1. I mean, but it's it's still possible to connect to Xbox Live through a Windows 10 mobile device. So, anyways, we have 52 million this quarter, and last year had 46 million. That's a grow. This growth over the year, pretty good, but quarter on quarter isn't too great as last quarter had 55 million. But again, and this is an area that where I expect some fluctuation. I don't know how Microsoft considers a user active. I don't, and there's so many different platforms that they could be considered active on that's just like, there's a lot of areas for this to move. Of course, the Xbox One S did drive a lot of that year on year growth, and if we, I don't know exactly what has caused that fall, but again, I think it is just general fluctuation. All right, and now speaking of Windows Phone as well, this is an area I will hand over to you as I grab more water. All right, well, the headline is Microsoft says Windows Phone retrenchment is to end in June. So as many people understand this, uh, well, based off of a tweet, as I understand, Paul Thorat, um confirmed, quote, well, confirmed that the phone business is set to wind down, quote, by the end of the current fiscal year, which, of course, Microsoft's fiscal year goes, um, I think it's uh, July through through June. You know, it's, it's six months off from the calendar year. Um, and so that means that it's, you know, there's, obviously, it's not making any money. We how could it be? I mean, it's it's not. There's no licenses sold of Windows 10 Mobile for um, below a six-inch display uh, d- size uh, device, and all those are free, of course. There's really no way to earn. I mean, there's no ad revenue based on it, and of course, the other way, only way Microsoft could make money on it would be devices. And like we mentioned earlier in the show, that there's just no devices available. So it would be really, really silly to even think that there. They would be making money. I don't know how they actually could be in there 
phone business. <clears throat> Magical mobile money genie. Okay. Well, that, there's always that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a reasonable option. Yeah. So Mary Jo Foley has confirmed this. He, she basically confirmed virtually no money left in the phone, phone business. Uh, I understand that. And, of course, Paul Thrott, uh winding down by the end of the current fiscal year. Fiscal year. Um, I want to add, well, I'll get your take on this first, Andy. Go ahead. All right. My take on this, I'm not shocked. I don't think anyone should be. And I don't know what's coming next for this area. I, I'm not even going to pretend to know what's going to happen next. But what I think is that none of it is going to be real positive for anyone who's hoping. I mean, we've seen these fits over not being able to update Windows phones to newer versions of Windows 10 Mobile, which we will talk more about with, the, I think it's the next story. But I really just, I don't know what's happening in the mobile sector. Whatever it is, I don't think it's going to be something that you're going to be able to update your supported device to. I think that if Microsoft does, well, I think it's inevitable that Microsoft will do more in mobile, but I'm starting to question if that's an, another category defining device. Maybe it will be, or if they're going to do shift towards an app focus. I don't know what's going to happen again, but I, I'm just not feeling too optimistic. I can't lie. Well, let me address one thing right away that I feel that the app focus needs to be shifted now maybe not in the next one two three years or whatever this is a long-term prediction but um the app model is is um it's going away eventually anyway that's not the point of this uh as far as mobile itself or especially retrenchment the term retrenchment this is something um i don't remember if it was uh, terry myers terry myerson or Sajid Nadella said that they were going to retrench. He, Myerson definitely said that Windows Phone was taking a year off, basically, almost in a scoffing, you know, laughing at it manner, which just, you know, stabbed Windows Phone users in the heart, and I, I, I get it. But um, the retrenchment is shifting, okay? They dug in, they just held their ground sort of for a little while, for a year or so, and now I think their, their focus is shifting. Their focus could be shifting completely away from phone. Absolutely no, no, no looking back. They're dropping it right where it stands and let it let it bleed out by itself. Uh, that sucks, of course. And we do see signs of that, and it's sad. But I, I mean, I think that could be very possible. Windows Phone or Windows 10 Mobile. Um, I don't see much. You know, Windows 10 Mobile. I don't see much of a a future for it. Now they're obviously shifting somewhere else. Microsoft Mobile. How they address mobile. Obviously, we see this with uh, the apps on Android and iOS, and um, the web services that we you can address on a Chromebook. You can pull up Outlook.com. You can go. You can um, Skype. You don't even have to even need to. You don't even need to install a Skype app. You can Skype message and video call people through the web. Um, works fine. They're they're making a play there. I they have been for a long time. This is not a secret. Um, I love that, and I think that is a wise direction. As far as these devices that are mobile, well, Surface is mobile, but smaller devices, Windows 10 on ARM, of course, this is a this was a big deal when it came out, when it was announced or leaked. Yeah, it was announced. Um, that is only going to pick up and go places. It will probably be very, very far from what Windows or uh, Microsoft mobile enthusiasts want to see but microsoft has a very very strong interest obviously as a company to make the choices now that are going to put them in a good position several years from now and i think um, having a three-in-one platform whatever that is you know um, windows on arm with cellular okay even the windows phone update now says um, uh, windows 10 on mobile cellular devices or uh, or something like that it's they're already you know they're they're peeking their hand they're showing i think a, a glimpse of the direction they're going with it and some people uh don't want to admit it or some you know whatever i'm not going to go there but mm. it's um let me hit the rest of my my points here i do feel microsoft is trying to make the right move with it 
uh, it would be stupid to not try to make the right move. Um, no one really likes it, but facts don't care about feelings. Okay, Microsoft is trying to do the right thing anyway. Um, the only, I was thinking back about this, the only unwise emotional move that I can recall uh, that Microsoft made was the persistence of the two Skype teams and not like Microsoft's teams that we thought was named Skype teams. But um, when Skype was acquired by Microsoft, the Skype stayed pretty intact for a long time, especially the management. And, and they continued to develop the Skype app the way they wanted to for quite a while. And then when there was uh, message or yeah, messaging everywhere, those apps, the messaging app, the video app, I don't know if I remember what else it was, those took off in a you know in parallel, but definitely separate, like no share code really. And of course, what happened eventually was that the Microsoft, you know, the app, the app, uh, excuse me, the Skype app ended up being the the new one the, from the ground up app, and it had a lot of bugs, obviously, to begin with. But the legacy Skype stuff was just left in the dust. And it was um, it took quite a long time for that to end and to Microsoft's detriment. And I think that was the only example I can think of in which nostalgia really slowed them down where emotions were stronger, at least for a while, than wise factual choices. Other than that, I think Microsoft, everything that they're trying to do strategically, they feel is a wise choice, obviously. And um, even if it fails, Surface RT or whatever, that was just ahead of its time, in my opinion. And we're seeing that come back around in some form, sort of, uh, with Windows Cloud, um, I, I believe. So point being, um, yeah, Windows Phone, yeah, I'm pretty much putting in the last nail in the coffin here. Uh, it's sad. And, and almost the same thing for mobile, Windows Mobile, but they're Windows 10 Mobile. But there's something else coming. And yeah, and I will say, I, I just to interject, you know, about that something else. What I do want to say on a positive, positive-ish note, is that Microsoft has two options for mobile. Really, I think that they can continue to go that app route, or they can, they can do a new device. But the thing is, that new device cannot just be a traditional phone. And I'm not saying it's going to be a Surface phone. I don't even know if it will be a phone. The mobile phone market is saturated. People are stuck in their ecosystems. I don't think the majority of people are going to change ecosystems. I feel like a broken record now. I'm sure I've said this before. They, they will if their company tells them they have to. That's the caveat. Right. But but continue. But it, yeah. that's, I don't think that's the majority of users, though. No. no, no I don't no, think no. the majority of the majority of people are likely not going to end up switching from iOS or Android unless one of those platforms either changes names or goes under. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Agreed. Yes. That's a good cap on it. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Something. Um, okay. So recently everyone uh, lost their shiznit with um, Windows phones that were not able to update to the Windows 10 creators update. Everyone blew a gasket about that. That was unfortunate and sad. But really there are um, – there's ways you can do this. Okay. So I'll try to run down this uh, – quickly where's my right tab here come on so uh, this is a decent article by Michael Allison just kind of explaining how to do this and it's really you know it makes sense but so if you're on an unsupported device and you're already on Windows 10 creators update um, um, I'm sorry just just that doesn't make sense if you're not on the Windows 10 creators update um, you can get in the win insider program obviously and you could get into slow or fast ring. And by doing that, it's going to take a few times, a few different updates to get to that. Once you, all your updates are done, you know, you reset the device a few different times and um, make sure you're current. Then you can switch it back to uh, your uh, release preview. And then it'll just maintain and you'll get the cumulative updates for build. It's, it's build 15.063, which would be, um, what is it called? Feature 2. Um, and just stay along that. That's basically the the creators update. Um, well, feature two is like a kind of like post creators update kind of build. Yeah, it's, it's yeah exactly. It's, it's root. It, you're right. Correct. Um, and then of course, if there's a device, um, if that's if you've gone to fast ring, 
to get uh, creator's update and you stay on release preview, you maintain that and you just not satisfied with it, you can always go back to uh, using the WDRT, the Windows Device Recovery Tool. Uh, plug your phone into, you know, it's just installed from the store. Plug your phone into that. Actually, I think it might just be a, it's an executable. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I don't think it's in the store, no. no it's ex- executable. But the Windows Device Recovery Tool, you, if you're listening to this podcast and you have a Windows phone, you should have this on your PC. And uh, plug it in, just, you know, it'll recognize what it is. It'll show what the latest available, um, like official, not official, what do you call it? The, the, the properly supported version is, and it'll flash it back to that. Really slick, uh, rarely goofs up, but it's, um, it, it should, it, you should have it on your, <laughs> You should have it on your PC to do that. Hey, just just to note that it is not available in the store, which is kind of hilarious. The, they have right. Centennial. That is true. That is true. It Why is isn't it there? Anyway, yeah. Okay, though, yeah, moving, moving on next. to the next thing on Windows Phone. No creators update, no problem. Here's how to simulate nightlight for your Windows Phone. This is another Vernon article, and then there's one more of those, and then I will cover some stuff. Yeah, so we did uh, lament our our sadness with the, the creators update for phone or mobile not getting the nightlight feature or the blue light reduction, and you know the thing that um, too much of your, your your display is is kicking in. I'm sorry, reducing or preventing your melatonin from kicking in. Uh, which is keeping you up at night and, and not good for your eyes and all that kind of stuff. So blue light reduction, we want that. Even if it isn't the official thing, you want to be able to make that happen. So it's it basically digging into your uh, your settings. You go into uh, into extras in your settings. Go to uh, color profile, and you can uh, adjust under screen profile. You can go to adjust. You need to go to advanced, and you got a few different sliders. And as far as the color temperature. You go from uh, cool to warm. And, of course, the warmer it is, the less blue light there is. And um, basically this is simulating night light, which um, it should um, allow more melatonin to kick in, you know, release in your body and whatnot. Um, I I actually find that really interesting how that affects your sleep and all that type of stuff. But... This is one way you can do it, and it's just kind of a wise thing to fiddle with that occasionally. If you're one that can be rather aware of your body, this is something to balance anyway. If you think you have a good rhythm with how often, uh, you know, how regularly you use, your fo- you, you use your phone, adjust some of these things for a week at a time and see how you, if you feel different. If you feel you, well, whatever. It's worth it's worth considering, especially if you feel it's affecting uh, your ability to go to sleep at night. Next up, we have another two-in-one. It's right in our Surface section. Since we haven't had new Surface stuff, we're talking about a new device here. So Acer is directly marketing, uh, targeting the Surface Pro series with a t- with two new devices, especially the, 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 the better one. It is the Switch, Acer Switch, uh, or Switch, the Switch 5 and the Switch 3. So this thing does look quite a bit like a Surface, and that's fine. The Surface is a good design. has the kind of flexible, um, I should say, uh, rigid but still flexible uh, keyboard. Even, uh, you know, magnetized, magnetically connects to the bottom and also flips up for more stability, just like the Surface. Um, it does have a kickstand, which, um, what's the term, self-retracting, I think they use in here, which is interesting, uh, or auto a, a U-shaped auto retractable kickstand. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, it does have a finger, a Windows Hello fingerprint reader. Fingerprint reader. I'm very happy with that. That's valuable. <clears throat> it is fanless, and this is even for some higher processors in here. We've got the latest um, Intel. This, what is it? KB Lake is the seventh generation i5 and i7. So this is still fanless. Um, Acer is calling it their liquid loop. So um, maybe conduct uh, uh, basically heat pipes or, or um, heat dissipation. That's good. It does have or, a or, or liquid cooling. Um, y- yeah, usually heat pipe is considered liquid cooling, basically because the uh, well, we're not going to get into it, but it is considered uh, liquid. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, liquid loop is what Acer is calling this. The display is. Um, well, HD plus basically is 1440p. You know, it's a 2160 by 1440. 
Um, it has support for Acer's Active Pen. I am not familiar with this. Andy, do you know anything about this? The, the pen? I have no. I have no clue. Okay, but it is very reasonable to assume that they modeled it similarly. Uh, you know, kind of modeled it after the Microsoft Surface Pen, which um, I I like. Like I said, it uh, run, runs KB Lake i5 or i7. And I did not see how much RAM it comes with, each one of these or, or mm. the um, the storage configurations. But we can assume, you know, um, you know, probably a 4 gig and an 8 gig and maybe a 16 in there. Who knows? Mm. Um, then there's the other device called the Switch 3. The display on that is still the same size but a lower resolution at 1080p. It does come with the pen or at least works with the pen. I, I didn't see uh, details of whether the pen costs more or not, but... Um, uh, still, it, you should get the pen with it, and it's got the crappier processors. It has it runs either a Pentium or Celeron processor, and um, at least it's not an Atom, I guess. But I don't I don't know. There's there's good and bad on all of that, yeah. but it is still yeah, fan. It's, it's still yeah, still fanless. I still just, fanless, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean a lot to me because um, I guess I'm not a, a, a processor guy, but the Pentiums and Celerons, um, I, I, I don't think they're very heat efficient anyway. So maybe you would actually need a, pan, a, a fan. You might actually more likely need a fan on the on the Switch 3 than you would on the Switch 5. I don't know. Maybe I'm not the best yeah, one to comment kinda interested on interested to I'm interested in seeing how that turns out, although I have a feeling it's not going to end well for some people. Switch 3 doesn't uh, does not appeal to me a, at all. Yeah, not whatsoever. The pricing, Although, unless, unless it was really cheap, if it was really cheap, then maybe I would consider it. But I don't know. So I don't think it will be. What we see here is that the Switch Five is going to be available in North America in June, uh, starting at eight hundred bucks. So that's um, not crazy. That is the base. Oh, that's yeah, that's pretty recent. That, uh, pretty decent. That I mean. is the base price for a Surface Pro Four, um, depending on your. I think that's probably without the the keyboard, and. Um, so yeah, I guess that's reasonable. It really depends on the rest of the specs. Didn't talk about RAM or storage. And uh, the Switch 3 will be available in North America, well, at the same time, in June, starting at 400 bucks. That's a, oh. That's the price of the Surface uh, 3. And of course, there will be another, well, we expect a clamshell Surface 3, you know. Or, you know. Not, not, no, like a, you mean cl the Cloudbook. Yeah, not the Cloudbook. Like cloud clamshell book. Surface 3, but the Cloudbook, completely its own thing, aimed at, uh, educational market i think it would be below that price so well yeah, I, I mean as far as the cloud book i don't i don't expect there to be a surface 4 i expect the cloud book to fill that gap if yeah, if it is that's a reasonable if it is what we if it is what we think it is um like we mentioned before i don't necessarily think it's going to be a two-in-one you know a detachable i think it'll be pretty stuck together <laughs> um, yeah should be interesting to see how it turns out though so Anyways, for four hundred we bucks, up. yeah, for four hundred bucks, I think this is Surface. Wow, the Switch Three will replace. I think that'll be an upgrade, or at least the next iter iteration for a I, Surface I was, Three. I, person. I will say, I will say, I was actually expecting that to be like six hundred bucks at least. So that that's decent. But look what yeah, you're running. I, I'm interested. I mean, I want to see I'm battery. Seeing, I want to see battery life on this thing. I am interested in heat. Yeah, that too. I, that's what I. That's what I want to see. Now, to be fair, my Surface 3 really doesn't get that hot, um, even when doing, you know, a lot with it. Now, it can't necessarily do a lot with that Atom and 4 gig of RAM, but it is, um, well, whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, Anyways, to next? power on through some stuff, yes. there is a Windows 10-powered smartwatch on the way, but it's probably not for you. German OEM Trek Store is working on a new smartwatch that's powered by Windows 10 IoT Core. It'll run universal Windows apps and utilize other Microsoft services such as Cognitive Services and Azure. The thing is, though, it is not aimed at your everyday average Joe. It's built for commercial use by enterprise companies, and it's intended for stuff such as inventory management in retail, industrial automation, fleet management, and similar enterprise situations. And so it's going to be an interesting little device whenever it comes out, but you're likely not going to use it. I would like to use it, and not oh, necessarily sure. because it's super cool or even, you know, oh, it can go for a week or whatever. 
I just want to see how stuff works on that form factor. Yeah, that's true. Especially the the see the apps. I mean, see um, UWP apps run on that. That I have a feeling. Will... I have a feeling that those apps are going to have to be like specifically made uh, I mean, just for that device. Sure. I mean, I cannot see. I mean, the again though, that kind of plays into the whole enterprise thing. You're not gonna. You're probably not gonna find most apps running well at whatever screen size that thing is packing. Yeah. I I am certain of that. But imagine this. Just one example that popped into my head. I I work with. I don't directly work with truck drivers, but I in where I work we have a fleet of truck drivers, and so I would say that having one of those. Um, okay, right now they have a handheld that they have to carry around with them when they do their their work. And instead of lugging that around, they could literally have something on their wrist that was small enough. They'd have to charge. I mean, it, hey, the battery life could only be eight hours, and it would still be okay for them. Um, and this device is something they could have wearing on their wrist when they're driving. They could get um, notifications that way, messages, whatever. Um, they could get... Uh, quite literally, you could have navigation on there. I'm not saying that this is necessarily wise. I don't know where I fall uh, as far as driver safety, having that on your wrist as opposed to a dedicated device um, on your dash or something. But the options, the, the, the potential for this, especially if it is powered on the back end by enterprise, where it's like, we want this, this is a productivity device. No, you're not fiddling or you know you're not playing around with it this is work related um i think there could be a lot of potential there and it's i I just love that this type of thing is getting tried even if it fails this is this is what we saw in star trek okay this is the stuff that we will eventually be doing in one form or another and the sooner we try to iron out those kinks and maybe throw a company out there and they try it and they fail miserably and they go bankrupt. But the next company that tries it is going to learn from their mistakes or whatever. Um, I like, I love this idea and I would love to wear this at work. They connected Wi-Fi or even to my phone and see real time efficiencies on the machines I'm running. Um, even get notifications when someone calls in sick. I, I, I literally already get those on my phone. I would just don't want to pull my phone out. Have that on my wrist. Fantastic. Um, and I'll be very, very productivity based. Um, boom. I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. And I really do hope that it works out well. And while I don't expect to see Windows 10 running on any smartwatch officially anytime soon, I mean, this is totally their own thing that they decided to do, I really, really do hope this goes somewhere, because it is a cool idea, and I, I, I just like, I like the concept of smartwatches in general, even if I think that the usage of most of them is kind of repetitive when you consider that phones are already doing this uh, so much of this stuff. I mean, like, phones replace watches, basically, so that's kind of going full circle and it's got to bring something with it in my opinion well i can anyways i just want to say that i pull out my pull my phone out of my pocket way too often at work half the time it literally is just to check the time i mean if i had a really quick app on my phone just to tap and check you know start a timer or whatever i'm anyway i would use it yeah i'm and i'm personally i'm big i'm big on always on display aside from the battery life because of, uh, you know, just like checking the time. I'll like just pull it out just a little bit. Sometimes I, I will wish I had that always on display option. All right. Andy, talk about yeah. Groove for yeah, a little go, bit. Yeah, to, go qu- to quickly uh, wrap stuff up, Groove Music's uh, refreshed look and some new features kind of come to all Windows 10 users. These include a Project Neon design step, which is a very blurry sidebar, which really you can only notice with the dark theme for the most part, sadly. I like it. It is a very early look at Neon in actual use, and will blur everything behind it. It isn't blurring just app content. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you op- so like if your Groove Music is fully updated right now, and you open it up, again probably on the dark theme is where you'd notice this the most. You will see that there is some nice blurry stuff related to whatever's behind the window, be it OneNote or your desktop. You will see it, and you see it most, of course, when you'll move the window around, if you move the around, window around. Like, say I was going to go to Snap It, right now it would move from over one note, and I'd see that purple disappear, and move it over to Audacity. And, of course, starts to see some bl- blue mixed in there. Although all of it, I think, is really too subtle at the moment. 
but this is an early look and hopefully it will change as time goes on and uh yeah now to move on to xbox stuff oh actually I, i'm sorry just to say one other thing it's got it also has music videos which first came back to groove on the xbox one okay i uh, came back now, in mobile also it came back in mobile oh, yeah, at the same time yeah. as it was as, it was a- testing but yeah yeah, okay. And then, uh, finally, on Xbox, Phil Spencer says that the best versions of third-party games are already showing up on Project Scorpio. Now, while uh, Phil Spencer is currently in Europe touring Mojang and Rare, that didn't stop him from giving some interviews along the way. He sat down with both Xbox On and Microsoft's News Center to discuss first-party games and Project Scorpio. In that interview, Spencer told... Uh, Xbox on that given this early on in development the best console versions of third-party games are showing up which is pretty impressive he added that the device will be the best console to play these games on which really harkens back to the days of the original Xbox which I mean that's the thing I, I, I talked about that console quite a bit early on in this podcast's life because that was the time when I was buying games for it quite a bit but it is an interesting machine to look back on because when you look at third-party games on that system, the best version of every single multi-platform game, and not, not counting the PC release, although sometimes PC releases at that time were really bad, generally, on the console side, the Xbox was the thing that won. It, it had the most horsepower, it was just leagues ahead of the competition, and that's really what Scorpio is. It's going to bring that era back, and I hope, really, really hope, that it works out well. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, and... Uh, Next up, oh, or unless unless you want to say something. Well, I thought you were. I thought you, I didn't know you had one more finished up. There. Oh yeah. yeah, just just one more. Uh, Praise demo is now on the Xbox One. It's an interesting game that both myself and Asher have been playing through, or rather the demo, which of course is like an hour long. In fact, it's even called uh, first hour or something like that. I don't have the exact thing memorized. But it's excellent. I mean, it's very reminiscent of both Deus Ex, specifically Human Revolution, the best, like, mechanically, and System Shock, which I actually have been playing System Shock 2 lately. It's despite the fact that it's from, like, 99, it's still terrifying to this day. Excellent stuff. And just having a... And I probably need to try out Bioshock, since I hear that's also another spiritual successor to both of those titles, but this is good really really good and if you want to check out asher's gameplay he has nearly an hour of footage up on the site right now and while asher did run into some performance issues along the way so far i have not met with any of those during my time with it although i'm only like the first half hour in okay i think that's it i i'm gonna add one really quick tip of the week here i know we're a little bit over time but this is important to me and um, i'm selfish that way uh, when I browse the web, I use I use Edge. I'm okay with that. I did not use any ad blockers, and not because I'm using Edge, just because I I'm okay with ads. Uh, one reason I'm okay with ads is that I can expect what type of ads I'm going to get. I know where I browse. I pretty I don't just spend a lot of time online really, and so I you know if I go to Amazon and I talk I search for a certain thing, I'll see that pop up in my ads. That's fine. Well. Occasionally, my wife uses my PC, which is fine, but she doesn't necessarily log into her own profile. She uses mine. So she could be searching for, you know, dresses on Amazon or on whatever not nearly as reputable site as Amazon that's just going to have some cheap dresses, for example, or whatever. And because of that, cookies and all, I get ads for that. And it's it's bothersome. It isn't, it doesn't bother me tons but apparently enough for me to go over time on the podcast to talk about this and so this is very simple people i I can't imagine you you don't necessarily know this but it's just a reminder go in and clear your cookies and you you know um in in edge or anywhere you can set it to just clear when you close close it out anyway but um i leave them up sometimes because that way i actually see uh, i don't clear it all the time because that way i get the ads that i want I don't just get something random, but it's under settings. Scroll down to uh, choose clear browsing data, choose what to clear. And the ones I've checked are only cookies and saved website data and cached uh, data and files. The rest of that I, I leave and I'm okay with that. doesn't bother me. But just a reminder that that is something you may want to do frequently, maybe even want to do that on closing out edge. But um, 
it's one way to get <laughs> to get the ads you actually want. Yeah, yeah I will say it's kind of funny, really, that I do everything I can to avoid having any cookies or whatnot cleared because I'm too lazy to log back into websites. Well, it, you can you can adjust it rather granularly. When if you go into settings oh, really? there, you can leave. I mean, there's like seven different options, and of course, I left on unch- I I think of the seven. Let me pull it up again here, quick. I will read this because you apparently you don't know this, Andy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, Come on, I'm, step up. I mean, Edge is good enough for for me to use as a primary browser, and I'm nearing the point of doing that. But I'm still, I'm still mostly a Firefox guy, just because I've had that set up on there for years now, and it's hard for me to leave. Okay. So, wow, this is actually more interesting than I expected. So the standard ones are browsing history, cookies and web cookies and saved website data. I leave that checked. Cache data and files. I leave that checked. And then the rest of these I have unchecked. Uh, tabs I've set aside or recently closed. Download history, form data, and passwords. So those are granular, form data and passwords. I love that. I'm glad to have that in there. Now there's some other more specific ones. It's a show more, show less type of thing. Media licenses, pop-up exceptions, location permissions, full screen permissions, webcam and microphone permissions, notification permissions, Adobe Flash permissions. You can go in there and choose which one of those you want to clear out. I mean, it's actually... Pretty nice, and of course you can toggle. Yeah, look, right looking there. at this, this is actually this is really good. And of course you can. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I guess it was a pretty decent, relatively decent tip. Um, and of course you can toggle to always clear whenever you close the browser, and you can just wipe all that out if you, if you need to. Um, I am happy with that, and uh, just kind of a reminder that that is that's a thing. That is the end of this thing, the MS Power User Podcast. You can follow the site on Twitter at MS Power User. Uh, and of course, that's the best way to have the new episode pop up in your in your feed in your um, yeah on your phone. You can tap it and listen to us if uh, if you want. You must already be. If you feel compelled to interact with us individually, and I do like that line. I say that pretty much every week. Twitter is our favorite medium. Uh, Andy is on Twitter at FusionFan45. I am on Twitter at VernonEL. And if you go to my Twitter profile right now, the pinned tweet is relatively important to me and perhaps it's important to you it has to do with a project that's coming up for me so if you want to do that uh check it out any last words Andy? let's finish this up uh hope everyone has a nice week absolutely take care everyone see ya